And this is being recorded, so you can always come back to the CNPS YouTube, YouTube channel and um, watch the recording. Yeah, thanks, Maya. Mm -hmm. Great. So, yeah, wow, so many people are joining us tonight. Thank you all so much for, for coming and spending part of your evening with us. Um, so some folks are still trickling in, but um, we can get started. So hi, everyone again. Good evening. Welcome to our March Naturehood webinar, Growing Good Food. My name is Jen Aguilar. I'm the Education Program Coordinator with the California Native Plant Society. And today I'm joined by my colleague, Maya. Maya, please say hello. Hi. Yeah, and I'm the, uh, I was going to say education. No, the Horticulture <laughs> Program Senior Coordinator at the California Native Plant Society. So it's nice to see everyone trickle in. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Maya. Yeah, and again, welcome. So tonight's webinar will be um, an hour long, so we'll have until 6.30. Um, and as Maya mentioned, it will be recorded and uploaded to the CNPS YouTube page within a few days. So if you need to leave early, don't worry. Or if you just want to watch this over and over again, please go back to the CNPS YouTube page to, to view this talk um, whenever you'd like. All right, so we're, we have two wonderful speakers today that are going to share more about their experience with edible California native plants. So let's just jump right into it so we can start learning more and um, you know hearing all of these wonderful things from, from both of our speakers. Um, so we first have um, Emily Wanis. Emily is the marketing manager and storyteller for the Ecology Center, which is a 28 acre regenerative organic certified farm and nonprofit in San Juan Capistrano. Um, her passion is bringing people back to the land through helping to reinvigorate traditional ecological knowledge like natural dyeing, seed saving, integration of native plants, and more. Um, so please join me in welcoming Emily. Emily, please take it away. <coughs> Thank you so much, Jen, and thank you all for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Um, like Jen had so uh, nicely introduced me, my name is Emily Wanis, and I work at the Ecology Center. And so I'm about to deep dive into a lot of the work that we're doing at the Ecology Center, as well as highlighting four of the native plants that we have on our property and some of the history, um, ways to take care of it, and other fun facts about those plants. I would like to say from the very beginning that I'm sure we have so many experts and so many people that hold so much wisdom and knowledge here. Here. And I am by no means an expert, but I am very passionate about this work. And I'm excited to tell the story more about the Ecology Center and some of the plants. And so at the end, if there's any opportunity for q and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, or maybe some of my other co-hosts might be able to share some wisdom as well. And so enough with that, I'm going to jump right in. Are you all able to see my screen? Jen and I. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. So the power of edible California natives. So as was mentioned, the Ecology Center is an ecological nonprofit and a 28 acre certified regenerative farm in San Juan Capistrano, where I'm at right now, in um, the oldest wooden structure in all of San Juan Capistrano. Capistrano. There's the missions here, of course, and so that's why I say mission, um, or that's why I say um, wooden structure. And so I am actually in the oldest um, house. It's from the original farmer who was a part of the Pony Express Riders, and I'm in one of the old rooms, where is now our offices. And so we had started on the front first acre, which in this photo, you're able to see the farmhouse that I'm talking about, as well as the palm tree. And so that was the one acre that we had from 2008 to 2018. And then in October 2018, we were able to um, help steward and through a leasing agreement from the city of San Juan Capistrano, um, the rest of the 27 acres that we farm today. And so this is something so beautiful and so important when we talk about thinking about how the choices we make today are going to help our past generations as well as our future generations. And so in, that, I believe, 1990 or 1991 a family, the Kinoshita family who owned this land in the middle of suburbia, 
um, instead of selling it to a private developer, they ended up selling this land to the city with the promise that everyone who leases this land, it must remain farmland. And so that's how we're able to have 28 acres of pure farmland in the middle of suburbia. <laughs> And so a little bit more about our farm, the front two acres make up our market garden, and that's acting as inspiration for what the future of accessible human scale farming can look like. And we say that because so much of the inequities that we're finding and the cost prohibitions that are happening with younger folks or even other folks who are interested in owning and stewarding land, just making it very inaccessible. And so how are we able to make this happen where we're able to localize our food system, where we're able to promote organic and regenerative farming? And it's most likely going to be through small land ownership and stewardship. And so this idea of the market garden. And this is something that we've helped cultivate in Encinitas as well as up in Anaheim with the school districts um, to show what on a small scale, human scale format with diversity on every row that we can feed ourselves, feed our family and feed our community with the abundance. And so we grow over 200 varieties at any given time on our 28 acres of land. About 70 or 80 of those end up being our flower varieties and not including our subspecies of flowers. Of course, um, flowers are beautiful and abundant and gorgeous and people love them. And they're also such important pollinators. And that diversity piece is an integral part of what regenerative agriculture is. And as you can see at the bottom, we're the only regenerative organic certified farm in Southern California. We got this certification about two years ago, and I think we are one of the farms, one of the first farms, if not the first farm to be certified um, in the new certification of regenerative. Our farm stand, this is the main part of our farm. It's open daily and we stock our shelves with our own produce as well as other organic growers for things that we are not growing on the farm. So for example, avocados we don't grow and so we partner with local farms and every, all the produce, if they're not coming from our own farm, it's coming from 250 mile radius or less. Most of the time that's about 150. And then we partner with over a hundred cottage style businesses um, in Southern California and more Northern California as well just to have this idea of what community collaboration can look like on a small scale localized way. We're in the business to shift culture and we believe by curating ecological experience for everyone, we provide creative yet achievable solutions for thriving on planet earth. And so in addition to being a farm, we have our farm stand, we have after school programs, which I just helped with one and I taught 30 kids how to dye with marigold flowers that we grew on the farm last season. Um, and that was beautiful and epic. And just this idea of coming back to the land, learning from the land, learning from the folks who stewarded this land before us. And so this land land was steward and is the unceded territory of the unceded territory of the Juanino Band of Mission Indians known as the Ahashman Nation. And so that's a really integral part of honoring the history of those that came before that are still here and will continue to prosper in the future. We also have adult workshops, we have community events, we have a fermentation lab, um, upcycling the abundance that's coming from the farm, and then soon we'll be having a cafe. And so I just wanted to be able to share a little bit more about the work that we do. And with that, for what you all came here for, edible native California plants that we have on our farm. The first one, so important and one of my favorites, and I had mentioned the importance of honoring the ancestors who have stewarded and continue to steward this land, the Ahashiman Nation. The elderberry tree is an integral, vital part of their history and of their culture and their diets. And so some of the characteristics and care that I made note of, that the berries can be harvested from early May um, in our bioregion towards the end of June in NorCal. And of course, they prefer moist soil, but we don't have a ton of more moist soil here. It's very clay-based, and because we don't get a lot of rain, a lot of the native plants are, of course, drought resistant, and that's something that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with. And I want to make note here as well, mentioning that I'm not an expert. In the center is from our children's garden. This is a beautiful 16-year-old elderberry tree. Um, of course, I do not know the exact species, um, but with that, I still think this information can be really helpful. And so from the bark, 
quite interesting. The oldest known instrument came from the Ahashiman people, and they used the bark of the elderberry tree for rattles, for flutes, and for clapper sticks. And then the flowers, they're harvestable for a relaxing cup of tea, and they contain similar antioxidants and minerals, as do the berries. And then the berries, we always like to say, do not eat raw. However, when they bloom, I'm very excited, and I'm going to take just a small handful and enjoying them. But most likely, you need to be processing them into medicinal offerings so you can make syrups and uh, tinctures, um, process them to a jam or infuse them into spirits. And so this um, is one elderberry tree. I believe we have about three or four elderberry trees on the property. And then from a natural dye perspective as well, you can make really beautiful blue dyes from this. Lemonade berry, um, among the Kumeyaay and the Kahila in Southern California, lemonade berries are valued as um, a big purpose or not purpose of them, but practice is using them to flavor water. And the berries are sucked on and then spit out for a refreshing taste. And they're spit out because there's one or two seeds on the center that you don't eat. Um, they're very sour, they're very potent, and they I personally think they taste like lemonade for sure. And for the seeds um, of the lemonade berries, you can grind them into powder and then you can drink them for remedy for fevers, coughs, and sore throats. And so this is just knowledge that I have heard from other people that have took the time to share that with me. However, I have not done that process, but I encourage you to try it out yourself. For bark and leaves, the bark and leaves are also made into medicinal teas. Um, the characteristics and care of the plant, they typically reach about one to four meters in height. And like I had said, in the inside, about one to two hard seeds are there. Lemonade berries are typically, at least in our bioregion, what I'm familiar with, available in the summer through early fall, which is perfect for a sweet, refreshing treat. And the fruits, as was mentioning earlier, about bringing in pollinators, you know, the fact of native plants, it's an integral part to bring native pollinators and to encourage that. And we've seen, and I've heard so many times in different articles from the California Native Plant Society and other resources, that native pollinators and native species are more likely to go to those native plants that they are so historically ingrained to understand and be familiar with. The shrubs are primarily found from Santa Barbara County uh, down to Baja, California, and thrive, of course, in coastal sage scrub and chaparral regions. And so um, the middle one is also, the, the middle photo is from our children's garden, and so this is such an integral um, part of, of the children's garden that all of these items are within that because what I'm referring to as a children's garden is where we have all of our um, children's workshops and our classes and everything that we offer but again for the first 10 years before we had our farm it was just the children's garden as the ecology center and so the idea was that when our founder Evan Marks came and started stewarding this land in 2008, that he was going to ensure that there was that honoring and there was the implementation of all uh, native plants. And there's, of course, a few naturalized plants as well. Cleveland sage, this is one of my absolute favorites for so many reasons. I actually live up in Long Beach and I was walking uh, by the LA River and I looked over and all of a sudden saw so many beautiful big bushes of Cleveland sage that I was able to respectfully harvest some of the leaves to make some delicious tea. And so some of the uses, uh, substitute for garden sage in recipes. It's very easy and I'm sure where you are, depending on where you're at, it's growing very abundantly if you start looking around and seeing some of them. Um, make a Cleveland sage pesto with the leaves. It's so good. It's so easy. Just take a simple pesto recipe and be able to translate where it says basil or whatever other herb that it's asking for. Substitute it with this and it's to die for. You can brew fresh forage tea, like I had mentioned. And another way is making an infusion. And so you can soak the leaves in olive oil and it's so good. Um, and another one that I had found is you can use the leaves to flavor your own beer, that same idea of infusion. The seeds, you can grind the seeds and mix the water for a nutritious porridge. It's nutritious. I've tried it. It's not the most delicious, but it is kind of fun to be able to go find and forage and then be able to create something very simple um, and that's sustaining. Characteristics and care, known as the most fragrant of all sages. And it's evergreen and it's a hardy perennial and so it's continuously blooming um, 
It can grow up to about four feet tall as well as four feet wide. Typically blooms in May and July, and it produces, like you can see in the photos, a beautiful lavender blue flowering spike and gray green foliage. It attracts pollinators, of course, that's a theme across these native plants. Um, and some of the simple care is just cutting back in early spring so it doesn't get too wild and you're able to make room for new growth. Moss is hardy, which is really helpful, um, less so here in Southern California, but in more Northern climates where frost is more common, um, it would survive that. It's drought tolerant and prefers full sun. Hoyon, or otherwise known as Christmas fairy. I've also heard uh, California holly. I want to make note too here is that there is a common misconception that Toyon is poisonous. And my understanding and my research, it's considered that only because people mis misconstrue Toyon and they see what is called a European holly, I believe, and they get confused by those two plants and European holly is poisonous, you should not be eating that, but Toyon, Christmas berry, California berry, whatever works for your, um, what, whatever name works best for you, um, it is edible and it has been used by the native communities on this land and throughout California for centuries. And it's really interesting as well because it's said to have been the reason Hollywood got its name because of its holly-like appearance of leathery green leaves and bright red berries. And I went down a rabbit hole of seeing that history and that influence of, you know, really California and Hollywood and the influence it has on the world and it's a very rich history and very interesting. Some of the uses for the leaves and bark, it helps in easing aches and pains, can be used as a wash on infected areas. The fruit flowers, um, there's many uh, different ways that you can use that, especially for menstrual cramps um, and can make a tasty pie for the berries at least or cider. And it tastes like a tart apple sauce. And with the berry similar to the elderberry, just make sure to be able to process it rather than eating it raw because it needs that level of care in order to um, let the things we're not really wanting within it to reside and then allowing it to work well within our digestive system. And I'm sorry to bounce back to the last one, but something that just came to my mind that I really want to mention, um, and that is with Cleveland Sage, <laughs> with Cleveland Sage, it is often, including myself, uh, sees Cleveland Sage or sees Black Sage, and it's really similar qualities, and there's, there's a lot of similar uh, characteristics of black sage and Cleveland sage. And so somehow it's sometimes it's hard to um, figure out which one's which, but when you look closely, you're able to see some different characteristics. Fear not though, black sage is also edible and you can enjoy the leaves and the flowers. And so that's just something that I wanted to add in my own journey. And I'm sure maybe some other people have felt that too. What's something important too is knowing that white sage specifically is overforaged and it's been misconstrued. And in order to honor the communities who have used that for centuries, and that is a medicinal guiding teacher, that um, non-native folks who not necessarily have a connection to it, if you see that, make sure that you're not for, uh, foraging it. And so I always like to highlight Cleveland sage or hummingbird sage or black sage, because these are all really delicious smelling and tasting plants that um, are able to be a little bit more ethical in our relationship building with them. Thank you for letting me go back to that. And then we're almost done with Toyon. So some of the characteristics and care, Toyon is very fast growing. It's reaching about 10 feet in five years. And there's some very old plants that I've seen that have reached over 25 feet tall or more. Uh, the species does best in full sun uh, to part shade conditions and can grow in a variety of soils. We have very clay soil down here, but it works in sandy soil and loam soils. And as if I needed to say this again, it brings a lot of butterflies and a lot of pollinators. They love the deep roots. So that The deep roots are really helpful for erosion control. They love the summer flowers. And of course, they're drought resistant. And then once established, like most California native plants, uh, requires very little water. And for the first few months after planting, that's when you're going to be giving them a thorough rotter because you think about these beautiful root systems reaching down, 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 that you're able to water enough where that water is seeping down to those roots and nourishing the plant in its fullness.
Um, and then berries come on fall to winter. And so if this is your first time hearing about the Ecology Center or it's not, and you want to learn a little more about our work, I'd really encourage you to follow us on our Instagram. I put .org at the bottom of this right before um, jumping on, and I realized I shouldn't have done that. So it's just the Ecology Center for our Instagram, the um, Facebook Ecology Center, and then our website, and you can sign up for our newsletter at the bottom of our page. And so with that, I hope that um, this was helpful and beneficial for you all and that you're able to learn a little bit. I am going to stop sharing my screen and then see what the Q&A format, um, what Q&A format would be best based on what Jen and Maya say. Thank you, Emily. Thank you for that wonderful presentation about the Ecology Center and some of the um, California native plants that you have on that property that are edible. Um, we do have one question about um, who who says where um, who says when a, a like a regenerative farm gets uh, certified. Do you have any yeah. other information about that? Yeah, I, I see that Q&A, Elaine, thank you for that question. And before working here, I didn't really know either because it is a very new concept. And so the regenerative certification comes from uh, the Regenerative Organic Alliance, ROA. And they began a few years ago, but in similar where we have certified organic on the packaging that we buy, and that ensures from a customer viewpoint that, wow, this is actually an organic farm because this body figured it out. That's the same way with regenerative agriculture, um, and it's ROA if you're ever interested. Um, I also see Lila said Cleveland sage only, or can you do similar things with other sages? Lila, thank you for asking that. And you can do them with other sages. You know, it was really hard for me to decide what sage that I was going to use. Um, again, always trying to highlight uh, non-white sage varieties uh, for all the things that I had mentioned. And so you can do this with Cleveland sage, black sage, hummingbird sage, and I'm sure there's dozens of other sage sisters and brothers um, that I'm not familiar with. And so you can um, also look that up online as well. Um, does Do you use raw Cleveland sage leaves and pesto or blanche first? Um, honestly, you could probably blanch it. I personally don't, but I'm also not the best cook. Uh, so I think either way is safe. Um, okay, and we'll take uh, that one last question and then we'll move on into our other presentation. Perfect. So um, somebody said, do you make any food out of native plants with kids who visit the farm? Do they have a favorite? Oh goodness, yes all the time and always. Um, and I'm trying to think of one that really, really stands out for me. And unfortunately, I'm just dumbfounded a little bit. And so there isn't one that's coming to mind. Also, because, because we're a production farm as well, we have a ton of vegetables and fruits growing. And so I can say they, they love those fruits and vegetables, but they're not necessarily uh, native to this area. So thank you all so much. I appreciate it. And I'm going to leave the floor back, back to you all and to Abe. Thank you, Emily. And please feel free to continue putting your questions in the Q&A. We will have additional time after, um, after both presentations. So yes, please continue to do that. All right. So next up, we have Abe Sanchez. So Abe is actively involved in the revival and preservation of indigenous arts and food. So two of his specialties are Southern California, American Indian basket weaving and native foods. His goal is to promote the decolonization of our diets by cooking and consuming native California and Southwest plant based foods. He works with traditional scholars and cultural specialists to learn culinary methods and cultural practices that he combines with his years of research and experience. He is particularly interested in traditional foods that are sustainable and readily available yet underused. He believes that teaching about these ancient foods and helping people learn ways to gather, prepare, and eat them, again, will make a significant difference in our health and the health of our environment. So please welcome Abe. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. <clears throat> and again, before I get started, I just want to 
it, this is going to be just a nice little dialogue. Um, I was not uh, able to get some slides in there, so I'll just have a little discussion. But um, I hope the information I bring to you is going to be helpful. And yes, so who are we? Who am I? I'm uh, Abe Sanchez, I'm a part of a collective of the, um, there's a number, a number of us in the revitalization of indigenous foods uh, is my topic I'll talk about here today. But again, over the years, you know, a lot of our focus has been working with Native communities on reviving some of these foods or just bringing these foods available to them again in their uh, regular diet. Um, there's been a lot of support, a lot of interest among tribal communities around the Southwest, pretty much really the whole continent on bringing these foods back. Um, now, the interesting thing that I want to kind of mention to you when I was uh, excited to work and present here is that as our experience has been with these, with the introduction of these foods, you know, with these foods in Southern California that I'll talk about, you know, are truly sustainable food sources. If you want to believe or not, you know, the concern we have with global warming, um, there are foods that we need to start looking at that's going to keep us fed. And some of these native foods are foods that are, are you know, sustainable. Um, the three I'm going to cover about a little bit is about is mesquite, nopal, and acorn. But I also want to mention too the importance of like um, Emily was talking about is the cultural appropriation uh, is a concern. Something I'll just be sensitive as well. Gathering these foods, yes, if you gather these foods in their natural habitat, you do need a permit. We do have permits um, that's provided to you know native communities or again other people if you're interested. Most people can get them all, uh, as well too, but we encourage not only that, but we also encourage people to plant their own plants in their own neighborhoods. Um, and because the issue today is where and how and what to gather. Um, some of the experience, I'll, what I'll mention to you is just that is, you know, for example, mesquite. A lot of people think you know, mesquite bean, uh, the botanical name Prosopis, Prosopis glandulosa. Uh, is the species here start that it starts growing here like um, um, Palm Springs all the way into Colorado all the way into Texas all the way south down into Mexico and further on this is a super sustainable food source today available that sustained natives for thousands of years as a food source um, most people when you talk about mesquite they think we're talking about the um, barbecue, you know, making the wood and cooking your steak on it and stuff, whatever. And needless to say, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the actual fruit that the produce, that the tree produces. It's a legume. It's a hardy plant. Um, it, whether drought or not, it produces plenty of seed pods. Um, super nutritional. Um, last year, of course, just where our drought seems to be doing a little better, but I was in Arizona last year and considering the drought we've had all these years, I was in Tucson in part of that area and saw that these trees were still producing, you know, food, um, plenty of beans. So again, a food that we do need to specifically think about as food that's going to feed us for the future. The thing that's got going and some of the things we kind of looked into and kind of ident in identifying these native foods is teaching people how to eat them. Our experience is, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of concerns. People are afraid, like Emily was talking about. Some people think, might think things are poisonous and so forth, but it's just getting people to learn how to identify these foods. That's kind of a barrier that we have a run into when we're talking to people on how to teach people how to identify these foods. Um, there is a number of species of, of mesquite beans. The honey mesquite, the one I'm talking about, referring to, this is probably the most desirable, probably the better flaving flavor one. Again, it's packed with nutrients. It's um, mucilaginous. Um, it's got, um, it's, it's a low glycemic food source, grows in, I guess, in, in deserts, produces its food, it, it, its pods. Um, so again, definitely a food source that we need to, you know, look into. 
I've, you know, from my learning on this is not only from my own research, but also influenced by other botanists and individuals in the Southwest, like uh, Gary Naphan, who has, you know, done a lot of work on that. Richard Felger, another very important biologist who's done, a botanist, should I say, who's done a lot in these revitalization or during, you know, talking about these foods that are, that we need to think about for the future. But, um, so that would be with mesquite. Um, needless to say, it only grows, I mean, growing here in Southern California, I'm, I close, I see it in Paula. I know in Paula, on San Diego County, North San Diego County, um, people have planted, they have planted there on the reservation and it's doing real good, produces fruit. So it does look like a little higher, a little hot, warmer weather. Um, whether you can plant it in my area here, like on the coast or, or um, LA area, I'm not sure if it, how it would do there. But again, a very um, sustainable, sustainable, productive food, food source. So that would be one with mesquite, um, multi-purpose, multi-uses. What we do actually, what we do in, in Chia Cafe is not only that we, when we introduce these foods is trying to get people to learn how to eat them. For example, uh, mesquite is more like a molasses sort of flavor. What you need to do, what you do is you gather the beans. The beans are usually done about mid-summer. You need to dry them out, you roast them, and then you grind them. And um, if you have a good grinder, I have like, for example, traditionally it was ground in stone with stone mortars, of course. And depending how much you know pounding went in, whether you can crack the seed or not and stuff, whatever. But usually it's just a pulp on the outside of the actual, the actual bean that was um, grounded. And that's actually good. I actually, uh, what I use today is I have my fancy dancy um, uh, food, process, uh, um, food processor, um, that I use to, you know, grind it. It's better if you grind, if you roast it. It only takes a few minutes to uh, roast in the oven. You don't want to over toast it because then that'll make a difference on the flour. And um, grind it up, sift it, and then you got your flour. Um, it's um, so it's just well, we you know many. It, it's eating a full strength is pretty. It's kind of strong. Um, again, it is sweet. Uh, what we've done with it in this revitalization of this food, for example, is to mix it, fuse other foods. For example, tortilla uh, goes, a flour tortilla goes real well, breads, um, you can add to it. It is a gluten-free, it is a gluten-free food source, so it's not going to be, you can't actually make an actual tortilla with it, but again, you can fuse other flours with it. I do things like bread fish or bread chicken instead of white flour with it, you know, grill that, that works really good. So again, many recipes, I mean, easy to Google today, many recipes, many people are coming up with all different types of ideas on how to utilize this food source. For me, it's one of my favorite food sources. Um, I, I call it to me a food of the future. Again, just getting people to learn more about it. Availability today for honey mesquite in particular is a little hard to find. Needless to say, there's an abundance of it out there. But again, to find that species is actually a little hard um, to find. There is, for example, the San Javier Tejona Autumn uh, Reservation in, in um, outside of Tucson. They do have a summer program where they do have the kids gather the beans and they roast it and they do sell it. Native Seed Search also in Arizona will sell it um if they have it available that honey's you know the honey mesquite species the one that you're most likely going to find today is a species coming in from south america which i'm a little disappointed considering so much that we have out here i mean that has a big carbon footprint coming all the way up here where we have such an abundance here of this of this food source needless to say we're hoping that if people do once it is demand if we make a demand for it, then I'm hoping that more people will start to produce it. And again, encouraging um, native communities to be the stewards in this and having them to have these businesses where they can help process and deliver this uh, food source to those who are interested. But again, a super food, um, it's good tasting and um, something that we are in, you know, and it's sustainable and, and deals with drought. Another food that we that we want to that I want to mention about as well as is the nopal piopuntias. 
all of them are edible. Um, this, as you know, mostly you can find it in Mexican markets. But then again, this is to me another special food because, food source because it takes bad. I mean, you can grow. You don't have to be a very good gardener to grow this. Anybody can grow on a ball plant, cactus plant, putting the pan to ground. You're gonna, it's going to take off, going to take care of itself. Um, it's um, here, especially in, in our Southern California area. I mean, it grows very easy. It's a pretty plant. Um, all parts of it are edible, super nutritional, um, you know, high calcium, mucilaginous, um, and low glycemic. People have, you know, proved that they've lowered their blood sugars by eating Nepal. Now, the tricky thing about Nepal in the reintroduction that we've tried to do as, a, as abundant, I'm talking about the pads, not the fruit, um, is getting people to eat this. Um, you know, it does have a lot of mucilaginous in it. And that's probably one other thing that kind of turns people off. American people, um, people that I, in our environment here, seem to not like slimy foods. And needless to say, uh, these mus foods high in mucilaginous is something that we're lacking in our diet. We eat too much processed food and foods like mesquite and, 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 and nopal are foods loaded with mucilaginous, which helps lubricate your intestines. So again, it's a super food for us, very easy to grow. All parts eat it. The flower petals are edible. As you know, in, this, in the fall, the fruit is, you know, ripe and processed and eaten it too. Many, you know, many recipes for that um, with the fruit. Now, nopal is basically a spring food. So coming around, April, May, we should be getting our pads coming up. Um, the trick, the one of the, the disadvantages about Nepal is people don't want to mess with it because of all the cloakets on it, getting their fingers stuck with it. But if you do gather Nepalis early when they're tender, that's the best way to get them. That's when you're able to kind of remove the um, cloakets off and again, develop that flavor. Also processing cooking Nepal, uh, we found that, well, use grilling in nopal is a good way to i mean to eat it it um, you're going to be able to keep the mucilaginous in the in the food source that dries it out a little bit so you're able to consume it you don't want to boil it because if you boil it you're actually going to lose a lot of that mucilaginous you want to steam it and a little trick you can do is if you do have you know the tomatillo husk the little green tomatillo husk you can actually put those in the nopal when you're steaming it, and that'll help kind of thin out that mucilaginous, so it's not going to be you, you they're a little more palatable that way. Um, uh, so again, as nopal, one of the uh, disadvantages we've seen is just again the fact that they are, you know, it's the glow kids in the mucilaginous um, you know, content that it has. The flavor too, it is a good flavor. It's 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 you know. My experience or our experience with these native foods is trying to get people to develop a palate for these foods. I mean, we have no choice. My, my, my message is, you know, the way the world's going with global warming, we have no choice. We have to start thinking about foods that are going to be able to keep us alive, foods that are sustainable, foods that can take, you know, global warming. Nopal is one. Um, there's many ways to cook it. And um, again, either if you're omnivorous, carnivorous, vegetarian. I mean, they can, you know, there are many ways that you can actually prepare in different ways. It's just getting people to develop a, uh, uh, a pellet for an opal would be one. Um, it, today, of course, consume still a lot, highly among Mexicans in Mexico um, is still consumed. Um, but here, and it has been tried, they have made attempts to try to bring it as a food source here to the main you know, population. But again, it hasn't really seemed to be taken off yet. That's been our, you know, we've made tortillas with it. We blended it, put it in the masa dough, um, done it that way. We've done, you know, smoothies, pineapple and little cactus kind of works good in the smoothie as well. That kind of cuts the mucilage in this a little bit. So again, a lot of recipes online, a lot of way, a lot of, lot of research has been done on cactus. But again, something, one of, one of my favorite foods, again, and just for, for the fact that it's just, it's such a, it's a sustainable food source in here in our area, easy to grow. You don't have to be a, 
expert gardener to even grow that is learning again when to when harvest it like I said, in the springtime you get the pads now you can also what's eat, what's called e eating the heart of nopal so in hard times what people did was let's say um now by the fall or the winter when the actual nopal has actually grown into it, its pads have grown into its older age stage you can actually still eat that as well um what you do is you cut the old pad, you cut it, and then you eat what's called the corazón, the heart, the middle of it. So you would kind of cut through it, and I apologize for not having any pictures or demonstration on this, but you can find this online, very simple. You can eating el corazón de nopal is one that you'll be able to see. So they actually take the outer layer of on both sides and you eat the core, the actual heart of the actual nopal. Um, so again, even in hard times, uh, you know, Nepal was edible, sustainable at any time. Um, you know, like I said, and, and like I mentioned earlier, that when when it's when it's flowering, you can eat the petals. When it's ripe, you eat the fruit. Even the seeds of the Nepal were actually harvested and ground and made into a flower. So again, many purposes. The root is medicine um, for many elements, um, um, but its big pop, its big use is just you know for diabetes. Um, for as being a low glycemic sort of food um, source for people to eat. Um, so that would be nopal. Nopal, again, a superfood, easy to grow. Um, it's just learning how to eat it. And again, developing that pellet is um, basically, you know, what we want to encourage. Again, all species are edible. All of them are. I mean, it doesn't, I'm, I'm talking about the one you're going to find a mark at uh, the market is your basic, you know, the basic the less thornless one, and I apologize for the botanical name, um, uh, Opuntia, uh, it's the, the one that is gonna be less spines. But even if you have the native species, those are good to eat the early um, pads. The earlier, the newer the growth, the less glocids you're gonna have, and they're gonna be able to be um, gathered then. But again, all parts of the pod, super food, good for us and sustainable. Another food I want to talk about too is also um, acorns. Acorns is, I, I will talk about, I mean, acorns is something that, again, when we want to talk about cultural appropriation, you know, it is a food source. It has been eaten. It, 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 many cultures around the world do eat acorns. So not only here in this part of the world where acorns eaten among native people, but other people too around the world. Um, acorns, again, another superfood, a good, good, you know, fats in it, um, low glycemic, um, a nutty flavor. All, most, all, all acorns are edible, but again, it's just learning how to process acorns. That's something that, you know, on reservations, there are people who are still, native people here in California are still utilizing it. We're hoping to increase it and get more people to um, consume acorn. But again, it's just this, it's one of the things that we want to teach about any of these foods is, you know, when to harvest, because a lot of us have kind of lost that connection on when actually is the time to harvest acorns. I'm sure this year with all this rain, this is probably going to be a bumper crop on a, a bumper crop on, on, with acorns. Um, some people were concerned about gathering in nature, in the wild. You know, that's my concern as well. But there's also parks where people... Uh, uh, where people, where, where these trees are planted. Um, so you don't have to go on and harvest them out in, in its natural habitat if you're concerned of, of over harvesting um, would be other recommendations that we give. But, um, you know, again, online, there's many ways on how to processing it. Once you get, you know, the, the acorn, the trick with acorn is gathering it in the fall, usually for us in this during the time when we when you have the Santa Ana winds, it's August, September, uh, September, October, when it starts dropping, depending, you know, on the on the season of the tree, you gather them, and then the thing that you need to do is you need to store them and you need to dry them. So you can eat when we try to teach the workshops on acorn, people come to us in the fall and say, Oh, I want to learn how to acorns. I got a bunch of acorns. Well, your acorns aren't ready to eat yet. Acorns have to be dry. Acorns, once you gather the acorns, you have to put them in a nice dry container. Usually I put like either in a paper bag or a gunny sack 
and you must leave it off the ground, put something on the bottom, because if it's gonna be, for example, on the ground and the cement or soil or dirt, whatever, it's gonna get moist and your acorns are gonna mold. Um, it's a little trickier, um, again, you know, process, you know, taking it, and I'm, what I'm sharing with you, because, you know, that's happened to me, what you do. So you need to put them, traditionally native people would have these storage, uh, willow storage kind of, baskets or, or containers that they would put the acorns in there off the ground and the willow branches of these certain plant would kind of help us bug deter insects and again it would help the acorns dry. Why you want the acorn to dry is because it's you notice when you crack an acorn in the inside it's going to have that little shell kind of like when you crack a peanut that's really high in tannins and if it's not dry that little skin is going to be really hard to get off so after you let your acorns dry for a good year then you crack them open. Um, if the skin does not come off, um, that little heats of peanut so it's, um, skin on it, you can also put them in the oven a little bit, let them dry. The more, the more you let them dry, the easier that's going to flake off. So once you've done that, uh, you can grind, you know, you grind the acorn and it's leaching it uh, would be the next thing. Um, that's to wash out the, can the tannins. Um, very simple to do. Um, if you're interested in our cookbook, Cooking the Native Way, we actually have the recipe there. You can buy that online as well. Um, and, um, and, on, and we'll give you the actual process on how to do leaching out the acorn. Um, washing, uh, you know, basically what I do is I just get a colander, get a nice cotton dish cloth, put it in there, put the um, flour once it's been ground, and then I just flood it with water, maybe four or five times, and you taste it as you go. And once you taste that flavor, that the bitter, it's not bitter anymore, then it pretty much tells you that um, you've washed out all the tannins. And it's something, it's, it's for anybody who's interested, it is a trial and error thing. You sometimes, if you overwash it, you will wash out too much fat out of it and it's not gonna taste as good. So it's just something that if, if you're interested, it's just kind of trying, you know, I'm trying to figure that out and how you're gonna, you're gonna wash it out. Cooks up, traditionally here in California, it was cooked in baskets with um, hot rocks that were dropped in, dropped in there. But you know, they put water, they want to make a mush, the acorn with water, and then they would have these volcanic rocks and drop it in there. And it was stirred around and cooked the acorns that way. Some native people here in California still practice that tradition, but if you, it's very pretty easy cooking it on the stove top. You don't want to use a cast iron pot you, or aluminum. I personally um, use a clay pot, which I like. Um, uh, that it ends up being a nicer temperature. And again, uh, just a couple cups actually expands um, into a big, you know, enough, enough acorn. Now, again, it is another food source that is a acquired taste. Um, but what we've done with it is we've actually fused other things with it. We made dumplings, we've made tortillas, uh, a flour tortillas, corn tortillas. So we've, we've fused the uh, cooked acorn meal into these flours and been able to make other foods as well. Um, again, and part of the challenge for us is just getting people again to learn and develop that palate for these food sources that again, sustainable. I, and I do want to make also very clear, you know, with acorn, acorn, you do have to be a little sensitive. Um, you know, it is a food here of native people in parts of, you know, Southern California or California and the Southwest. Um, we include, we hope to include, and we're always encouraged to include as native people to be stewards of these foods and in particular acorn as well as um, if anybody wants to make an actual business into it. And I when I mentioned that because acorn is another food source that is being looked at as a sustainable food source. Um, scientists are looking at it. I mean, here in our environment here in California, I mean, we have the live oak. You go up in the hills, you have all different types of species. They're all edible. Um, each tree is going to be, some trees can taste a little better than others. I remember because these are not hybridized trees where we have like for example our apples are all going to taste the same because they're all grafted acorns or mesquite beans again are going to be all a little different um people back in the day knew that they wanted that tree over there because we knew they knew that that tree produced a bigger fatter acorn produced more more food 
um, or again, a bean, a mesquite beans too. Uh, if you pick from the wrong mesquite bean tree, some of them can be a little bitter or a little too tart. And some again would be a lot sweeter. I usually, what I do when I gather mesquite beans or acorns, I like to kind of go around and kind of crack one over and taste it. If it tastes good um, to me, for example, meat mesquite bean, I would like prefer to harvest from that tree. But if it's a little too bitter or not good enough, then I probably wouldn't gather from that mesquite tree. Um, and mark that tree and hopefully go back next year to gather from that one. Acorns the same. The bigger, the bigger the nut, the more flesh you're going to get, the more you know, meat you're going to get. So again, that would be with acorns. But just want to encourage that, uh, you know, that it's been our experience is as, and I'm sharing this with you all because I, you know, we have, we have no choice. We have to look at food alternatives. Um, you know, with all these carbon food, foods coming from around the world, I mean, it's all great. You know, we can have watermelon all year long or apple or whatever that's coming, you know, grapes all year long come from other parts of the world. But again, it's just, you know, what it's doing to our planet when we have these food sources available here, um, you know, and uh, like it's mesquite. I mean, there's such an abundance. And I feel comfortable, for example, talking about encouraging people to use mesquite and nopal because there is an abundance of it. Um, acorns, again, it's a little more sensitive. There's not, you know, and a huge abundance of it. Whereas mesquite bean, there is a lot. I mean, you can drive in the Sonoran Desert, and I just got back actually yesterday from the Sonoran Desert. And I mean, you can drive for hours and hours and hours in the mesquite tree forest. And basically, all you and most people only know about mesquite flavor. What they do, they chop these trees down to make charcoal, they cook your steak, or make your you know potato chips, whatever it's going to be, with the mesquite flavor. And we're missing the boat. I mean, it's the food source. It's it's the food that the, the it's the the bean that this um, tree produces that is a sustainable, very nutritional food source available for us today. Um, nopal, again, to, to kind of sum that up, another food source here in our area. Um, you know, it's just getting people to kind of develop a, a palate for these foods and how to taste them, how to cook them. Uh, I know that a lot of these cooking shows have been really good. I, I, my experience in trying to teach these foods and people to eat these foods, um, I'll say that you know I think um, I think our society here, American you know community in the U.S. is you know we have a lot of those food network channels and all that stuff, whatever. That's really increased people's interest in foods. I noticed that so people are a little more are not as picky anymore. People are a little more adventurous and wanting to try these different foods, which is a really good thing because I keep on saying, I mean, we have to look at, you know, these food stores that are nearby, nearby our area that are sustainable, that we can grow, easy to grow, and there's abundance of them. So um, uh, I can have any questions. Um, Dan, if anybody has any questions on that or any clarifications on, and I, again, I apologize, I didn't have any slides. I just wanted to kind of have a little discussion with you. Yeah, thank you so much, Abe. I think you provided a lot of great information and there was a lot of conversation in the chat about, you know, everything that you're sharing. And I, I did want to mention, um, I, I do see in the chat, everyone would love to have um, the resources shared with them. Um, I and I can take note of all those resources and share those in um, the recap email that we will be sending out after this webinar. So don't worry, we'll have those for you. Um, sure. But yes, Abe, there are many questions uh, for our you. Book, I mean, and you can also give you know access to our book. I mean, it's not, a, it's not an expensive book, Cooking the Native Way has lots of information on there. And I'm, okay, I'm open for questions. And I saw Mike, I do, I am good friends with Mike Wilkins. I saw somebody put that in there. Mike's a good guy. But anyway, yes, nice. question. Um, yeah, so there is a question about, lots of questions about the mesquite. Do you know of any animals that eat the mesquite bean as well? I think we're thinking yes, about- Yes, yes, there. yes, yes. Um, a lot of wild animals eat mesquite beans. You know, the wild, uh, the peccaries, the- um, in the desert, um, many you know animals, of course, eat this. Uh, sad to say, a lot of these wild pigs are eating mesquite beans. They're fattening up on mesquite beans. 
that is a concern that people have about are we going to take this food away from these animals in the forest or wherever they're going to be growing. Yes, it is a concern, but um, I feel, and brought up from my experience working with skeet, there's an abundance of it. There's a lot of it. Um, today, needless to say, um, I'm sure it'd be a very tree, very easy tree to farm. It's just grafting that nice sweet, finding that nice sweet tree and grafting that. I know some people are doing that, but um, yes, of course it does survive and, it, and many animals eat it. And, um, but again, there's a lot of mesquite bean. I don't think today, I don't really worry about when I go get mesquite beans because I don't think I'm going to be taking much from animals out in the area, but um, you know, I'm not going to be competing with them, but anyway, that would be, hopefully that'll answer that question. Great, thank you, Abe. And um, someone is mentioning the cafe that you mentioned. I'm assuming they mean the Chia Cafe Collective. Yes, Can you share yes. a little bit more about the collective? That. And, yes, thank you. And to clarify, we are not an actual cafe, you guys. Sorry about that. Chia Cafe Collective is just a collective of native and non-native people in the promotion for, and the revitalization of indigenous foods. And not only to indigenous people, but to all people who are interested in these foods uh, available. We do have our cookbook and I'm sure you probably would provide that information about our cookbook. It's not I mean, online, I mean, Amazon, whatever. It's a few, like about 20 bucks, something, whatever. It's not, it's not expensive. Um, great photos, great recipes. Uh, it's, I'm not, and I'm gonna say our book is not, I'm not, it's not the Bible on Southern California native foods. It's the beginning um, on how to get people to start cooking food. We kind of just came about this cookbook and decided that we come up with different recipes and how to use this. And I wanna be specific our book. Our book, a lot of recipes in our book are fused recipes with native ingredients. Um, so if you go in there thinking you're gonna find recipes on how Native Americans eat, you're not really gonna find that in there. Maybe the acorn, you'll be able to find it because it just explains to you how to use the acorn. But again, a lot of our recipes are fused with other familiar food sources because the intention of our cookbook is to get people to start developing up a palate. You know, just to mention to Emily, Emily, when you're talking about the um, Cleveland sage, you can use it also in your bread, in your baking. Instead of um, rosemary, you can put it in your bread and, and you'll try it. It's fantastic. Anyway, I just want to put that in there. Thank and you for that, Dave. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to do that. <laughs> try that. Instead of rosemary, oh. try, try um, Cleveland sage in your bread. Okay. So you're, you can also put in your tortillas too. It makes a wonderful tortilla. I'm already, so, I'm just getting so hungry. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Another question? Yeah. So um, someone's asking about um, how to eat nopales. Is there, um, can you eat them raw? Do you have to cook yes, them? What are your yes, recommendations? You can eat them raw. They're just a little, you know, they're, of course, you're going to get full strength. Steaming them is really the best a way to not use so much of that mucilaginous um, ingredient because you know you want to make sure you, you want to try to eat that and what and um, I there's many ways I, I another good way is also grilling them on the barbecue like when you're grilling your steaks or like you're going to grill your vegetables um, most Mexican markets you'll be able to find them already you know clean with prickly pear you know the the, the um, glockets off just grill them like you do the vegetables they that goes it's a really good way um you know to eat them um they go good with you know as vegetarian to me i like them with steak carne asada they do very good with carne asada you can actually even get the pads and instead of tortilla you can actually use a grill pad like your like a tortilla like a bread so you put your stuffing in there and you eat it that way that's another good way to eat it or you can make it like a quesadilla you can kind of put two pads a little cheese in the middle and grill it if you don't have, you can also do like on the stove, on the skillet, many ways to eat nopal, but you can eat it raw. You can put it in a smoothie. Like I mentioned, um, pineapple and nopal is a really good combination smoothie. Uh, it seems that those two ingredients work real well. Um, but um, yeah, grilled, steamed, um, in stews. Uh, you can also chop them up and put them in your beans. It, that's a good way to put them as well. Um, so again, we encourage people just, you know, many ways to try to eat nopales. Abe, I think you're making everyone hungry for, for well, dinner. Well, I hope so. And I hope everybody's <laughs> out there starts looking about these, you know, these food stores and encouraging to, you know, we have to make a demand for them. We, I mean, I, I, 
we pushed the um, mesquite. I always pushed mesquite. And people ask me, hey, but I'm trying to find mesquite. And built, you know, uh, the honey mesquite. I can't find it. Well, you're probably not going to find it. It's kind of hard because people aren't marketing it. People aren't putting it up. It, there's not. It's not out there yet. There's not a big demand for it. Uh, people are starting to look for it, but and like I said, if you you can find mesquite flower in your local health food stores, but is that species coming from South America? I personally don't like that species. I don't know the botanical name, can't remember it. But you're going to find it. Most parts of markets going to have it. But the honey mesquite, um, very, um, it's a it's delicious. It's a good food. I mean, it's a super, again, a super food would be with um, the nopal, the mesquite. So. <laughs> It's beyond barbecue, okay? Beyond mesquite barbecue chips, you know, which is which is too bit sad because that's what most people think of, you know, or they think of the charcoal. But no, we're chopping these trees down to make charcoal, and they're not bringing you know, we're, they're not going to be making any more food for the world. So that would be that. Any other questions? Um, well, we're going to we're going to end our, our webinar here. I do want to be conscious of the time. Thank you all so much for joining us and a big thank you to our speakers today, Abe and Emily, for sharing about their experience and for sharing about the Ecology Center and Abe, all of your experience with cooking with, with these edible native plants. We're, we're very, very thankful to have um, you share your knowledge with us. And I did want to, to end with, you know, please feel, feel encouraged to, to grow your own edible native plants and, and use those in your own gardens to, to put into your recipes. So um, that's a, a great way, a, a nice hobby even to, to incorporate these foods into, into your own dishes. Um, and I uh, also wanted to mention that we will have another Naturehood webinar next month that will be focused on um, bouquet arrangements. So if you're excited about um, the blooms that you're seeing across California so far, um, you know, we can talk about how we can bring some of that beauty inside of our homes um, using the, the flowers growing in our own garden spaces. So again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We will follow up with um, the resources and the link to Abe's book um, and have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Abe and Emily. And yeah, we'll see you next month. Thank you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Now I'm hungry for dinner, so that means you're yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, bye everyone. Yeah. Bye.